This is not a steroid or even a pro-hormone. This is psilocybin. And before you say that's definitely not performance enhancing, let me ask you this. How many times have you decided enough's enough? I'm gonna get serious about my training and nutrition only to wake up the next morning in a pile of shameful crumbs. Whether you know it or not, your brain is constantly working against you. Here's a good example. Say I flip this quadrant lands heads. Flipped it again, also heads. That means this next one's probably gonna land on, nope. Heads again. If you thought that it was gonna land on tails, that's the gambler's fallacy at work. Erroneously believing that a certain random event is less likely to happen based upon the outcome of previous events. And this is just one example of how our brain is so easily tricked. So I thought it'd be interesting to dive into some of the research surrounding these commonly used recreational and medicinal substances like cannabis, psilocybin, and DMT to explore any potential benefits they may offer and see if these substances can help us overcome the inherent limitations and biases that our dumb monkey brains have. Now, why am I so personally interested in this? I've been chasing success my entire life. Professionally, I tried to sell life insurance, real estate twice, SEO. Hell, when I was 12 years old, I started Ray and Luis's lawn mowing service. The only reason we called it that is because every other lawn mowing company in our neighborhood was run by a Mexican family. So me and my white friend thought that was the only way to be competitive. I even made a nice little clip art lawn mower. Nothing was successful until these YouTube videos. And personally, I went through a lot of duds until I met my thick wife and we rescued 14 dogs. Needless to say, I love my life. So much so that the thing that keeps me up at night is, is my fear of going to bed and not waking up. Because I don't know about you, but my life kind of feels like I laid down to take a nap when I was six and woke up and now I'm 36. What the hell? And it makes me wonder if we're all just doomed and the best case scenario for our life is we end up like the old guy from Up. And just so we're clear, these are just for educational purposes. I would never recommend anybody take these. Some of these are actually illegal. I would never take these. <laughs> plums are buzzing. Now you might think I ate a few of those edibles just for the hell of it and it might make a more interesting video, but in fact, I'm not a huge fan of them. And I don't think you'll be either when you learn that they could potentially stunt your ability to adapt to stress. I ate too many. <sighs> Now I'm sure you've heard of the fight or flight response. You experience danger, your body releases adrenaline, and you go into a heightened state. That's a very simplified version of it, but you get the gist. And it responds to an acute or temporary stress while your body has a totally different system that, did you even know about? That constantly tries to maintain homeostasis called the endocannabinoid system. When you're stressed, the ECS can actually help you mitigate some of that stress. If you're injured, it can help you with pain and inflammation. If you have low energy, it It'll increase your appetite. You know that feeling you get after you've been running for a long time? Not me, I don't run, but some people do. The runner's high? That's due to increased circulating endo... That fucking word again. That's due to increased circulating endocannabinoids. Yes! What happens is when your body gets out of homeostasis, various cells throughout your body synthesize endocannabinoids, of which there are two types, and their names are very difficult to say and not that important. They bind to two types of receptors that are located throughout your body. The CB1s are in your brain and your central nervous system, while the CB2s are found in tissues that play a role in immune response. Cool story, bro. What does that have to do with cannabis, THC? Well, obviously you might have noticed it's kind of in the name. The reason they found the endocannabinoid system in the first place is because researchers were looking at how THC affected the body, and then they were like, dude, what they found is it actually binds to the same receptors that are in the endocannabinoid system and either mimics it or disrupts it. Potentially the reason why sometimes you feel happy, hungry, horny, and other times you are crippled by anxiety. The problem is your endocannabinoid system is phenomenal if left alone. You're fucking with it. It'll actually adapt and evolve to repeated stressors. So if you're constantly interrupting your ECS, then you're limiting your body's ability to adapt. It's that simple. And we all have somebody like this in our lives. It's like talking to your own dick. Now, don't get me wrong. If you're somebody that deals with chronic pain, epilepsy, MS, then this is a game changer and one of your best options. I'm just saying that if you're using this mistakenly to help deal with stress or depression, probably not the right one. I would look into... Well, that 
fucked my entire day. I haven't taken psilocybin since I was younger, so I forgot the important fact that when I personally take it, I'm unable to speak. I spent the rest of the day walking around staring at random shit. one beautiful moment where I thought about my wife and giggled like a 14 year old schoolgirl, but other than that, I was over that ride. Now, just because I didn't have the greatest experience, it doesn't mean that for some people, it's not the exact answer they've been looking for. Because when you look at the statistics, every year over 800,000 people call it quits and tap out. That'd be like if every year San Francisco just slid off into the ocean. And then if you dig a little deeper, you realize that 284 million people suffer from anxiety, 264 million from depression, another 107 million from alcoholism, and when you add them all up, it's over a billion people. Kind of sounds low considering I don't know one person that's not a little messed up. We all got something. The reason I bring that up is because they've done studies looking at the efficacy of psilocybin for treatment resistant depression, which is just defined as a person who doesn't respond to two full courses of antidepressants. In one study, they had 12 people take a 10 milligram dose followed by a 25 milligram dose a week later. And when they followed up with them after a week, eight of those 12 people said they felt like they were in remission, which is somewhere over here on the happy scale. And when they followed up with them three months later, five of those 12 people said they still felt like they were in remission, which is pretty damn good considering traditional SSRIs did nothing for them. Now that's very promising and exciting, but the question is, how does it work? Well, psilocybin itself isn't psychoactive. When it's ingested, it's quickly metabolized into psilocin. And that's where you find out how little understood the human brain is and how I almost broke mine trying to make this video. When you look at psilocin, it closely resembles serotonin, so much so that it's an agonist to the serotonin receptors, meaning that it could bind to them and trigger a response. And that response is similar to serotonin. It affects mood, appetite, sleep, cognition. But when you look at the link between serotonin and depression, you realize there isn't one. The biggest takeaway from that study is there is no convincing evidence that depression is caused by low serotonin concentrations or activity, which is a big deal because that's the basis for prescribing all SSRIs. Again, it's in the name, Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitor. I think I did that right this time because I'm not high, which is a big deal because that's the basis for prescribing all SSRIs. You know those commercials that have a jazzy name like Euphorics, but have a ton of side effects. In some cases, but rare, may cause redness, dryness, dry mouth, felching, prolapsed anus, spontaneous combustion, diverticulitis, but for a lot of people, SSRIs work. And for that matter, so does psilocybin. I just thought it was important to note that we don't particularly understand the mechanisms of why. And that is frustrating. Another recent trend, which I'm sure has been going on for years, but just getting more popular is microdosing, which is taking one tenth or a sub perceptual dose of mushrooms. Problem is most of the research doesn't really support it. And any benefits seen could be chalked up to the placebo effect. The reason that most research around psilocybin has done at higher effective doses is because at those levels, it downregulates your default mode network. Think about that as what your brain falls into at rest daydreaming, recalling memories, thinking about the future. Hence why psilocybin works so well with depression, because there has been a link between increased activity in the default mode network and depression and anxiety. Increased activity in the DMN has also been associated with obsessive thought patterns. So they've been studying the potential benefits of psilocybin with addiction. Also, I'm attempting to film and walk to my kitchen at the same time because I'm hungry. One study on alcohol had 23 of the 48 people over a 32 week period stay abstinent, while the placebo group only had 11. A study done with tobacco had nine of 11 people stay abstinent for 30 months. Abstinent is such a dumb word. Also, another important note to add is that psilocybin is just one potential treatment option for depression, anxiety, PTSD. MDMA and ketamine also share that same similar structure, so they are serotonin agonists, and for some people, they're the breakthrough that they need. Hell, the guy that made me this cool thing said the one thing that helped him stop drinking and turn his life around was ketamine, MDMA, wood therapy, you know, exercise, water. Like, I can't just name one. I don't know what I thought it was going to be like, but that wasn't it. Now, I very well could have done it wrong because the how-to videos of freebasing DMT and spirit bombing yourself to the next dimension on YouTube are not the best. After all that, I'm still afraid of dying. It didn't help.
I guess it goes back to my favorite saying of all time, which is no one's coming for you. So we probably shouldn't waste any time and appreciate every single day. Because who fucking knows? If you want to support my veteran woodworking buddy, I'll link his Instagram below. And as always, programs are all 30 days, 20 videos, 20 bucks. Get after it.